Welcome to A Century of Speed, a celebration of the fastest cars on sale in the UK from every decade since the 1920s. From 100 miles an hour to 300 miles an hour, including the most glamorous, the most revered sports car names in the world. And starting with one which hmm, you might not expect. So today, you might know Vauxhall as a maker of dependable family fleet and driving school cars, but back in the 1920s, this was a sports car. A century ago, the idea of a production car achieving 100 miles an hour was breathtaking. But Vauxhall was a company at the forefront of performance engineering. Its 1911 Prince Henry model already acknowledged as the first true production sports car. Vauxhall's OE type, made from 1923, was advertised as the car of grace that sets the pace. Doesn't sound quite so catchy today, but one reader of the Auto Car magazine complained he couldn't buy a car that would cover a flying mile at more than 100 miles an hour. So Vauxhall invited him to Brooklands to see a 3098 model, the very one he'd ordered in fact, with full mud guards and upright windscreen and see it crack the tonne. It hit 100.7 miles an hour and was the first production car in Britain to be recognised with a 100 mile an hour top speed. Now by the standards of today, this does not feel much like a sports car. However, with its overhead cam engine, this was a car capable on the Brooklands banking of doing 100 miles an hour. It's got a centre throttle, then the brake is on the right, but apparently that's no good, it operates on the prop. So all the braking is done by this lever out here. And then you do some turning, fearsomely heavy steering, cold at the minute so I'm not sure it's very happy. Right, another double D clutch change coming up. Get it right. Get it wrong. There it is. And there's fourth. It's got a lot of torque and it's very lazy. Oh, and there's a corner coming up so I've got to worry about that. Oh, I've really got to worry about that. And then I've got to worry about, oh, then I've got to worry about the gears and the steering at the same, oh, at the same time. There we go. And yet, in among all of these things to do, some heroes still drove it at nearly 100 miles an hour. It's got an H pattern gearbox, but the wrong way around. So first is over there, then second, then third, then fourth. And it was only really until, well, after the Austin 7 arrived, in what, 1926, I think. And that had clutch, brake, accelerator with a gear stick in the middle. And that's only after that 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 started to become more commonplace. Before that, you had pedals and gears all over the place. From a manufacturer not known for its sports cars, today then, we go to one which has always had performance at its heart. From the early 1920s, Bentley won Le Mans no less than five times. First with a three litre car, then with a four and a half litre car, and eventually with the Speed 6, which had a six and a half litre engine. The company's founder, Mr. Bentley, W.O. Walter Owen, was the kind of guy who believed there was no replacement for displacement. Some of his wealthy backers, though, thought differently. They were big fans of things like a supercharger, and they'd been known to race trains across France in road-going Bentleys. And by the 1930s, one of them was the boss of the company. But W.O. was still the chief engineer, and under his direction, Bentley produced the 8-litre, a hugely opulent 2.5-tonne car whose rolling chassis alone cost £1,850, an exorbitant price at the time. I have always wanted to produce a dead silent 100 mile an hour car and now I think that we have done it, W.O. said at the time. The 8 litre engine was a masterpiece incorporating all of Bentley's state of the art technology. It was a monoblock overhead cam straight six with four valves per cylinder, twin spark ignition and a crankcase forged from a magnesium alloy. And we're away. What a lovely thing. There's no synchro mesh apparently so I will have to double D clutch and hopefully Oh, nailed it. Now, Bentley guaranteed customers that these cars would do 105 miles an hour. This was W.O. Bentley's own car. It's still owned by Bentley today. And it is vast, but it's very quiet and it's very luxurious. Not sure I'd want to do 100 miles an hour in it. 
but it is a lovely, lovely thing. There we go, that's done. Now, Bentley made a hundred of these, but unfortunately it arrived at the same time as the Great Depression. So, it didn't make them any money. In fact, it cost them so much money that Bentley was bankrupted. And it had to be rescued in 1931 by Rolls-Royce. And the two companies stayed together until 1998, when Bentley and Rolls-Royce were separated by a man we'll come back to later. And the late 1930s to mid-1940s, there were some alterations to the map of Europe. But following that, designers and engineers had a newfound understanding of materials, construction processes and aerodynamics. With an engine of less than half the size of the Bentley, the XK120, Jaguar's first sports car since the SS100 went out of production in 1939, would hit 133 miles an hour in almost standard form. Now that car had an aero screen rather than the full height windscreen of this car, but otherwise it was as it drove off the forecourt. Ah, oh, and it is lovely. That engine is so silky smooth, the steering is so beautifully direct. You have to say, that by the 1950s, late 1940s, early 1950s, people had started to get cars absolutely right. In modified form, the XK went much faster again, as fast as 172.412 miles an hour on the Yabeki Highway in Belgium, a stretch of closed road also used by car magazines of the day. In 1950, an XK120 even finished fifth overall in the gruelling Mille Miglia road race. But in the early 1950s, a newly resurgent German powerhouse had other ideas. The 300 SL was how Mercedes returned to sports car racing for the first time since the 1930s. The 300 SL, or W198 to give it its codename, took second place at the 1952 Mille Miglia and the top two positions overall at that year's 24 Hours of Le Mans. Now Mercedes had not intended to build a road-going version of its SL race car, but in the 1950s America was booming and Americans wanted to spend big money on exotic cars. So at the 1954 New York Auto Show, Mercedes relented and it introduced this, the 300 SL Gullwing. It would cost $11,000 and it would hit 146 miles an hour. And although this is a road car, well, you can still feel the racing pedigree through it. It is noisy, it's raucous, it has got some engine. What a sensational motor car. It gets hot in here. People have people who drive them a lot, so they do get really warm. It's that kind of thing. It's quite uncompromising, really. But it's very sophisticated. Old cars do tend to get, as things wear, they tend to get a little bit of slack around the straight head. But as you turn, it just sort of takes up weight and feel. The gearbox is really, really good. Much better than some British gearboxes of similar age. And this car was from an age when racing really did improve road cars. Race cars really improved road cars. And this is from an age when you, oh, you just, I just think you could drive this at speed for hour after hour after hour. If the 300 SL Gullwing was directly created from a racing car, our next car was, albeit more loosely, inspired by competition too. In the 1950s, racing cars began to have their engines placed behind the drivers. That wasn't generally the case, though, with most road cars. Until, that is, a very small team of brilliant young engineers at the Italian Grand Tour maker Lamborghini came up with this, the Mura. And, I mean, just look at it. If there is a better looking car than this in the whole of Christendom, I don't know what it is. The reasons for putting an engine behind the occupants is sound. For one, they can sit lower because they don't have to look over the engine to see where they're going. That reduces the frontal area of the car, an aerodynamic advantage, which means that fitted with a transversely mounted V12 engine like this, this Mura went on to become the fastest car of the 1960s, with a top speed of 174 miles an hour. Secondly, putting the engine in the middle of the car can bring the big mass of the engine and gearbox closer to the centre of the car itself, which reduces the, science bit coming, polar moment of inertia and makes the car more agile and turn faster. Now that's all well and good in a racing car, but for a road car, that kind of lack of inertia can make it quite twitchy. 
and they say never meet your heroes, but well, let's find out. Takes a while to clear its throat and then, oh man, what a noise, what an engine. The driving position is appalling, but it's just so lovely. You might note that there has been a significant name missing from this list so far. Well, let's make amends now. Not once, but twice. Firstly, with this, the 365 GT4 BB, with one B for Berlinetta or Coupe, and the second B for what's under there, Boxer. The BB wasn't Ferrari's first mid-engined car. That was the actually not Ferrari badged Dino. But with the competition from the Mura and then its newly developed Countach, this marked the first time that Ferrari put one of its 12-cylinder engines in the middle of a road car. The Boxer is a flat 12-cylinder engine of 4.4 litres. It's a 180-degree V, if you like. There are four triple-choke Weber carburettors, and the whole lot is mounted above a five-speed gearbox. This car was Ferrari's own 1975 British motor show car, and it's wide even by modern standards, but with 375 brake horsepower, it could hit some 186 miles an hour. That made it the fastest production car available in the UK in the 1970s. The 1980s, well, that would bring up a rather more significant number. It was the late 1980s then that the top speed number hit new heights, 200 miles an hour, or 202 to be exact. When the Ferrari F40 arrived, some said it was a cynically created car. Ferrari's rare 288 GTO was selling for big prices. Porsche was finding buyers with its technological fest, the 959, which, like the F40, was developed for a race series that no longer existed. Some composite construction aside, the F40 was a relatively simple proposition. It just had two seats, it didn't weigh very much, and it had lots and lots of power. The F40's twin turbocharged V8 made 478 brake horsepower, a staggering figure back in the day. Now at the time, Ferrari assured Autocar that regardless of the 959's existence, it would still have made the F40. It said that customers had told them the 959 and other Ferraris for that matter were becoming a bit too plush. Ferrari said it wanted the F40 then to be fast, sporting in the extreme and Spartan. And it is Spartan and raucous and raw and what an amazing machine it is i mean there's just a bit of fabric on the dash and bare carbon everywhere these sort of fixed back bucket seats but my goodness what an experience and actually what a mix of things because there's all that rawness and yet a real sophistication to the way it drives the ride quality is very good the steering is just sublime it's unassisted, as are the brakes. But everything is so linear and so positive, and it weighs so little that it just turns and grips. They are such, such lovely cars, F40s. Really, really brilliant. I've got a massive soft spot for an F50. I think they were a bit underrated at the time, but now everybody says, oh, they're underrated. They're so overrated in being underrated. But the F40 is still an astonishingly, astonishingly special car. If the F40 was raw and simple, the fastest car from the 1990s and still perhaps the most revered single sports car of all time was anything but. The McLaren F1 was the vision of one man, Gordon Murray. And although he worked for McLaren as a Formula One car designer, the F1 wasn't supposed to be a race car. It wasn't supposed to be raw. It was supposed to be the ultimate road car. McLaren had established itself as the most successful F1 team of that era, but slightly disillusioned with the sport, Gordon Murray asked McLaren to let him follow his road car dreams. Then he set about designing a carbon fibre tub with three seats in a central driving position. Having looked around a few manufacturers, he eventually asked BMW to create a naturally aspirated V12 engine. He wanted to bring the car to the road at around 1,000 kilograms and 550 horsepower. He came close to the weight and easily exceeded the power. The F1's 6.1 litre V12 sent the car into the record books with a 240.1 mile an hour top speed. 
Although it was a road car, it won Le Mans outright too, and McLaren built just 106 of them, cementing the F1's place in history and guaranteeing it would be a future megastar with a price to match. So expensive, in fact, that we haven't been able to insure it today. But we have done once before. And let's just hear... The response of that going up and coming down as well, I mean on downshifts, the throttle response on that is off the scale. Oh my goodness. Let's just take that through the gears again, I think, because why not? When Autocar road tested the McLaren F1, we figured that its performance figures might never be bettered. We were wrong. So you know I mentioned earlier the guy who was responsible for separating Bentley from Rolls-Royce. Well his name was Ferdinand Pieck and he was the head of Volkswagen Group when it happened in 1998. Actually funny story, he wanted to buy Rolls-Royce as well but didn't quite manage it. However, he was also responsible for the resurgence of Bugatti with this, the Veyron. No production car had ever had such an unreasonable brief as the Veyron. It had to have 1,000 horsepower, a top speed of over 250 miles an hour, and it was allowed a price of a million euros. Volkswagen Group struggled to get it done. A concept was shown at the 1999 Tokyo Motor Show with a never-to-be-used W18 engine, and it took until 2005 and multiple re-engineerings before the Veyron finally reached the streets. The thing about the Veyron is that it makes going incredibly fast incredibly easy. We road tested a Supersport, lined it up at the start of an airfield with people who had never driven it before, and at the end they were doing 200 miles an hour. It's still the second fastest that I have ever driven, but it's just like driving a Golf, all the way to 254 miles an hour. The only people that could really do things better than Bugatti then were Bugatti themselves. So the Chiron takes the Veyron concept and does largely the same thing, only much, much better. The Chiron Supersport 300 Plus is all about numbers. 1,578 brake horsepower, 1,600 metric horsepower, 2.3 seconds to 62 miles an hour, 12.3 seconds to 186 miles an hour, and so on. And there's another very, very big number. At peak power, its engine is getting through 1,000 litres of air a cubic metre every second. Anyway, what is it like? Well, it gets on unbelievably fast, right? There's a little bit of turbo lag because it's still making 200 brake horsepower per litre. Of course there's turbo lag. It pushes on like you would not believe. Build speed like you cannot possibly imagine. It is so fast, so brutally fast. It's not an instant Tesla Model S kick in the back where it just really shoves you like that, but it just builds and it does not stop. It just keeps going and going and going. Even when you are beyond 350 kilometers an hour, it just carries on. The 350 is what, 200 miles an hour? But actually, despite all of the power and technology and the cost, so much of the Chiron's pace is actually about its tyres. There's a reason the Chiron's top speed, 304.8 miles an hour incidentally, isn't recognised by some official bodies, and that's because it was only recorded in one direction, because the tyres might overheat and fail if they went against the grain on Volkswagen's test track. Bugatti X-rayed tyres before they started to be as sure as they could that they would not let go the track was entirely clean. Of all companies, Volkswagen is keen to make sure it doesn't do any harm to a test driver while trying to set a top speed record. Bugatti now has a partnership with Rimats, 
maker of explosively accelerative electric cars. But while you can just pump water around an internal combustion engine to keep it cool at ridiculous speeds, it is harder to do that over prolonged periods with a battery or electric motor. Once though, we said the McLaren F1 speed would never be beaten. We were wrong then. Who though would be quite so bold as to say the same this time? A full feature on all of these cars and more is on sale in the 40th anniversary issue of Classic and Sports Car magazine, which is on the shelves as I speak, or go and see classicandsportscar.com for more details. And there's always more here on this very YouTube channel, plus we're on autocar.co.uk all the time. We're very grateful for you watching us. Thanks very much. See you next time.